Welcome back to Network Africa. Now, Egypt's interior ministry had den has denied responsibility for the death of an Italian student, but a recent New York Times article reports that eyewitnesses saw two men believed to be state security agents leading Mr. Regini away. And a joint Egyptian-Italian investigation is underway, but the head of Egypt's initial probe has previously been convicted of torturing a prisoner to death, leaving many skeptical that the killers will be found. According to the independent Cairo-based Nadim Center for Rehabilitation of Victims of Violence, 474 Egyptians died at the hands of security forces and well over 600 people were tortured while in detention in 2015. Most of these incidents do not necessarily draw significant scrutiny, with the exception of two prominent cases back in November of 2015 when a man was tortured to death by police in Luxor and another that was a doctor in the Suez Canal city of Ismaila. Well, we're joined from Cairo by the voice of America's Edward Dirani and for more about this need for Egypt to have a security reform. Edward, thank you very much for joining us on Network Africa. My pleasure, Sophia. Now, based on these statistics that we're looking at from this report, my question is, analysts, or analysts are saying that Egypt's security establishment needs a reform, but what is the government saying about this? Well, two things. First of all, the analysts that are quoted in the story that's making the rounds on the Internet um, in an Australian newspaper are people who I believe are Muslim Brotherhood supporters. But that aside... Uh, so, I mean, I would, I would expect them to say something like that. Uh, it probably does need reform. Um, clearly, the police and the security services do um, treat people badly on, on occasion. Uh, I wouldn't deny that. I'm not sure whether it's more widespread or less widespread than other Arab countries. Um, and as far as the numbers that are being put out in the media and by the Nadim Center, I really couldn't vouch for them. I've seen a lot of numbers floating around since the revolution in 2011, and many of them are exaggerated, not necessarily for torture, uh, certainly for casualties, people being killed. Um, and the numbers are used to uh, either to defend the government or to criticize the government. So I, I would be very skeptical of any of the numbers I'm seeing. But that being said, uh, I think probably the security forces do need reform, um, no question about it. But mm -hmm. people who are pushing reform at a time when the security of the country is unstable uh, are doing it, some, some of them, not all of them, of course, uh, for ulterior motives, which is that they want to flip the situation back to the Muslim Brotherhood. And, um, well, I mean, I think you need to understand that, whether people out there watching your network want to support the Muslim Brotherhood or don't. But... Anyway, it's part of a, an ongoing polemic uh, between those who support the government and those who support the Muslim Brotherhood. And okay. to the backdrop, of course, of a situation where the security forces probably do need reforming. Now, Edward, what about the issue of trust in the police force in terms of the Egyptian public being, you know, not being sure who works for who? Because that's one of the issues that was highlighted in this report. Is there anything being done to actually restore the public's trust in the police? Well, the president obviously believes that something needs to be done because he called the interior minister uh, in on Saturday and uh, asked him to do something about the uh, current security situation. Uh, certainly he is under a lot of criticism, both at home and abroad, and he obviously thinks something needs to be done. So if he thinks something needs to be done, quite clearly it does. Um, that, of course, being said, uh, we need to take into consideration that uh, if you destabilize the police, you'll destabilize the security situation, which I don't think many people here in Cairo want to see either. So it's uh, it's sort of a squaring of the circle, if you want to put it that way. Well, based on the call you said the president made over the weekend, at least we can see that there's a work in progress. The VOA's Edward Iranian, thank you very much for joining us on Network Africa. Now, students at South Africa's University of Pretoria have taken to the streets to protest against the use of Afrikaans language as a means of passing instruction. We understand that the demonstrators are boycotting lectures
and many are also reported to have gathered outside of lecture halls. Demonstrators are also believed to have interrupted classes and those who were in class are now standing outside. This move is reminiscent of a similar one which happened about four decades ago in Soweto. Back in 1976, the student uprising was also against the use of Afrikaans as a medium of instruction. Now, staying in South Africa, several race-related incidents there have reignited debate around racism recently. It's been more than 20 years since the late Nelson Mandela became South Africa's first black president, and sadly, it looks as though racial tensions continue to simmer in the country, with wealth and income gaps that are still clearly visible along race lines, fueling perceptions of white privilege. When CCTV footage showing three white men pulling a black man out of his car and beating him up came out six months ago in Cape Town, some called it an act of road rage. However, the victim, Somwabile Jakuja, deems his experience an act of racism, and many across the country agree with him. Jakuja collapsed soon after he reported the attack to police and ended up spending several days in the ICU. It took six months for the police to make an arrest. On Monday, February 15, three suspects were charged in court with assault and released on bail. The case comes at a time when racial tensions are simmering in a country more than two decades after it emerged from the ashes of apartheid into a new democracy with Nelson Mandela as its first black president. According to political analyst, Aubrey Mashiki believes that racial divides still exist in South Africa. In 1994, we did not become a non-racial society. We are not a non-racial society today. That is still a goal we must uh, achieve. So what was defeated in 1994 is apartheid, the apartheid system, not racism. Ian Cameron is a spokesperson for Afri Forum, which often represents white South Africans on issues such as affirmative action. We speak to people in the middle class um, every day in the normal working class. They all tell you, no, but I'm happy. I get along with everyone. So, so I think it is being blown out of proportion a little bit, and I, and I often think it's to, to drive political ideals, um, to try and get political support. Uh, and unfortunately, the youth are often victims of that. Two decades after the end of white minority rule, wealth and income gaps are still clearly visible along racial lines and perceptions of white privilege loom large. Angry blacks still crammed in badly serviced townships have clashed with police during violent protests, while some whites feel they have been unfairly punished through state policies aimed at correcting the imbalances of apartheid. Even Julius Malema, the fiery and controversial leader of the Economic Freedom Fighters Party that seeks the nationalization of mines and land and the curbing of white economic power, says there is a long way to go in fighting racism. They were beginning to expose racists. It is happening with individuals, not institutions. It will get there. Because when we say to institution, give a uh, the workers 51 percent give the workers top uh, management uh, positions those workers are black so that's how you transform institutional racism by allowing greater participation of black people in those institutions the ANC has organized several anti-racism marches attended by hundreds of people on the streets of Johannesburg Many agree that race is a dividing factor in post-apartheid South Africa that needs to be categorically addressed. South Africa's annual economic growth has languished between 2% for the past five years in a downturn resulting mainly from poor governance. Critics say ANC is responsible for failing to improve the lot of blacks due to rampant corruption in its ranks. Others blame blatant racism and inequality for the drug on South Africa's economy. For more on this issue of racism probably lingering in South Africa, we go live to Johannesburg where the CEO of Junto Media 
that uh, Mr. Lucas Malloy is standing by. Mr. Malloy, thank you very much for joining us on Network Africa. Cynthia, thank you and uh, good day to your good viewers. Day, good day to you, Mr. Malloy. Now, in truth, did racism, was racism ever a thing of the past to begin with? Because last year we saw what happened with the xenophobia and this time around we're still talking about racism 20 years later. Uh, I don't think that uh, we are by any chance close to racism being uh, a talk of the past in, in South Africa. Um, we need to, to remember also where this whole thing is coming from. Mm -hmm. It is not only the case of race in South Africa, but it is the case of economy that is linked to the race. So in South Africa, it is still a case where blacks are poor and whites are richer. And that is the, the, that is the most uh, deep-reaching problem that the country is seeing even at the moment. Now, what we understand that the ruling party um, often organizes numerous anti-racism marches. But is that really where we need to see emphasis? Or should we not be seeing proper measures to ensure that, you know, um, um, the, the issue of possible racism, I use the term sparingly, it becomes a thing of the past? Look, um, it, it's, it's, it's not going to take marches to get rid of racism. Yes. It's going to take a little bit more of a decisive action and the rule of law for racism to stop. So um, if you look at uh, from January when, when the year started, it started on a very uh, racial tip in South Africa where we found a lot of... Uh, of uh, uh, racial remarks being made where we saw people like uh, the lady called Penny that uh, made uh, uh, remarks of black people being uh, being monkeys and, and so many others that came mm -hmm. after. Now the thing is until you take a stand where, where racism or such utterances are, 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 are made illegal by certain legislative uh, uh, pieces in the country we are to see it continuing in that. My fear about it, and this is what uh, I had uh, posted during the weekend, and that is that uh, we are uh, getting closer to where we are going to see loss of life yeah. that is um, related to, to these racial attacks and that. And, uh, and things start uh, verbally initially and that, but they get to the stage where one person is going to take it a step further and we are going to see that's related to this. It is the time that the ruling party needs to take a stand mm -hmm. in dealing with racism and you cannot deal with it with baby gloves. Well said. Mr. Lucas Malloy, thank you very much for joining us on the Talk of Curry. Appreciate your time as always. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cynthia. So to come on Network Africa, it's 92 hearty cheers for President Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe.